Welcome to Deep Tech 315. I'm Gene Munster along with Doug Clinton. This is when we talk about the three most important topics in tech this week for 15 minutes or less. And our three topics are the earnings related to Google and Microsoft and specifically what's going on in the cloud race and why that's important. Second, we'll discuss meta results. And last, talk about some changing tides and how traditional automakers are approaching the EV opportunity. And so we'll bring it back to the top, Doug. We have Microsoft, Google, both reporting on the same night, both telling two slightly different stories related to the pressure points on that. That would have been their cloud business. Azure saw a step up in their growth rate from 26% in the June quarter to 29% in September. Well, we had Google showing a decel from call it 28% in June down to 23, actually missing street estimates, which we're looking for 25% growth. So when you put all that together and mix it up, uh, what was your reaction as you were uh, thinking about those two, that dynamic? Uh, the sell-off for Google, I mean, almost 10% in a single day, I think tells you more about where the market's at versus really the numbers. I mean, cloud, it is an important part of Google's long-term story, but it's still a really small part of the overall story. I mean, search far and away is the most important part of their business. That part of the business was fine. Cloud was weak. Separate that from the stock reaction, which felt aggressive given that reality. Yeah, this is um, the tail wagging the dog in this case. I think it is a little bit, but I think it also speaks to, the, to another reality, which is it feels like Microsoft has set itself up really well to be kind of the dominant cloud provider for AI. And if you look across what the big AI companies are sort of doing in terms of uh, partnerships with these cloud providers, obviously Anthropic just had a big partnership with AWS a few weeks ago, which also tied some funding to that. OpenAI has been long tied to Microsoft. Hugging Face has a partnership with Microsoft. Inflection has a par uh, partnership with Microsoft. And so a lot of the big players have gone toward Azure and not as many have chosen GCP. And I think that's, that's maybe a little bit uh, of the backstory behind the reaction to the numbers. So, but there's this huge emphasis that we're putting on these cloud numbers. And uh, for perspective, Azure's business is more than twice the size of Google's cloud business. Their profitability is off the charts. It's like 40%. Google Cloud's at a 3% margin. So these are, are, are there's different scales of the business. But m my sense is the reason why this is so important and the reason why the tail's wagging Google as the dog is because this seems to be like the, the, the cutting edge for investors is how they're thinking about who has the lead in AI. And it's almost like all the good things that are going on with search and what the potential could go on with search with AI is forgotten because they're losing the race in cloud. And uh, do you think that's kind of the, the dynamic that we're seeing? I think Google just needs to show a little more with AI. I think, I think year to date, and I'm like, we own the stock. It's one of our biggest positions. Year to date, uh, the story has kind of shifted and now it's shifting back. So at the beginning of the year, uh, Microsoft was outperforming Google. I think the narrative was open AI is sort of running away with the AI race. I feel like that narrative softened a little bit over the summer. Google launched BAR. They started to uh, build some more AI into their products. They launched a phone that had some cool AI features. Um, and now it feels like that narrative is resurfacing again. Is Google still a real player in AI? Are they really at danger to losing um, kind of the golden goose with search to chat interfaces. And that question still feels uh, unanswered. One of the, I think, disappointing things about the call uh, too was it felt like there was a little bit of a maybe hesitancy in terms of giving a timeline on when Gemini, mm -hmm. Google's next generation AI model will come out. It was supposed Agreed. to be in Q4. And now it maybe seems like that's not so certain. Yeah, it may end up being Q4, but not so certain. And as we have been thinking about this too. And we debated like, are we on the right side of this, uh, this trade, if you will, between Microsoft and Google and, and the sense that Microsoft has more momentum here, but I feel like Google hasn't even really started to show what they can do in AI, especially around search. And I, I think that, um, I, I think ultimately that this, I understand the topic is focused on these cloud numbers, but my take is for Google investors just to take a deep breath, present company included, 
and to look at the the breadth of what they've been investing in AI. We haven't seen it yet, but I think over the next year, we're going to see some of those benefits and uh, love your take on that too. I'm still very optimistic about Google. Still optimistic. I think they still have an underrated asset, which is so much data on consumer preferences and consumer behavior. No company in the world knows more about how consumers think about uh, buying things than Google. I mean, literally billions of times a day, people go to Google, a search engine, they tell them what they want. That data should ultimately help power really great experiences uh, that use AI. We just haven't seen it yet. And so I think we just, we kind of just need to see something more tangible. I still have optimism around Gemini for that. I'd be curious if you and I are on the same page on this view is that I think this is a similar transition that we saw from desktop to mobile is that when that happened with Google, they did see a dip down in their search growth coming from the mid 20% down to 10%. There was some macro things going on at the same time, but it, it, their search growth did decline. Do you think the shift to AI is kind of a similar type of a, a, a shift, a step function as we saw on desktop? Mm, that's not my baseline bet, no, because I think that a lot of the AI use cases are uh, different. We kind of map these out you can kind of think of them in different ways, but a lot of the AI use cases that I think are really compelling are actually different. Like if you're asking who was the president of the United States in 1825, right? Like Google can answer that or ChatGPT can answer that, who cares? The, the reality is it's about the same experience either way, that doesn't matter. But I think when you're still searching for products, that lends itself to search a little more. When you're looking for AI to help create something, that lends itself to AI. Search doesn't do that. That's not a core use case. And so I think you have to consider those use cases as you think about what could the headwind be to search. Mm -hmm. Well, we are expecting a headwind, and we think that ultimately they will come back on the uh, right side of that equation, which uh, speaking of headwinds, uh, our second topic here is meta, the stock, also down on the print. And it was up after they gave guidance. It was up going into the earnings call. And then look out, uh, CFO Susan Lee mentions some economic, uh, the, the geopolitical uh, things that are going in the Middle East and how that's have a softening impact on month to date, the first month of the quarter. And shares quickly started to trade down, trade down about 6% quickly right thereafter. And the thing that surprised me is that guidance was uh, including, I would guess, that guidance that they gave, which for December was, depending on the numbers you're looking at, a percent, two percent higher than where the street was at, that guidance factored in this slow start to the quarter that she mentioned because the geopolitical. So from my view, it was like, actually, they everything was fine. They probably would have guided higher if not for what was going on with the geopolitical. And uh, what, what's your take on that? You saw the same thing happen to Snap, and it's always always funny to reference Snap relative to Meta, given how much. Yeah, they had the Meta same is. commentary about geopolitical, didn't they? Same comment and the same stock reaction. To, I think uh, Snap was actually up almost twenty percent at one point, and sort of I think ended up close to the flat or down, maybe a little bit uh, after earnings. But similar commentary, you know. I think that uh, the bottom line is. The market, the way the market is thinking about the world is if there is some hesitancy from a company, if there's any sort of indication that Q4 is looking a little bit sketchy, a little bit soft maybe, I think they're putting more weight into that commentary than maybe around the actual guidance itself, to your point, which was above the street. And fear rules right now. Just look at what the fear market's rules. been doing all week. I mean, that's it. It's got to be pristine for investors to be okay with a quarter at this point. It does. Yeah. And, and I think aside from what Meta said on the call and kind of the Q and a about uh, some of the maybe potential softness, I thought some of the product things they talked about still left me with some more optimism. I I've felt all year, basically since last year, I mean, we're, we've kind of annualized now the Facebook trough of last October where everybody thought Mark Zuckerberg was done and he was spending like a drunken right. sailor on, on yeah, reality labs. And now look where we are, stocks up 3X from there. Mm -hmm. I think some of the products though that we're seeing them put out, the, the Ray-Ban glasses, no, they're not as 
uh, impactful as as Apple's classes. But I think that you know they're pushing things like that. Llama has had thirty million downloads last month. They said it's the most used open source AI model in the world right now. And so they're innovating on all fronts. And I think this year of efficiency has also been a year of innovation for Meta. Mm -hmm. So we also own Meta at Deepwater. And I can say that after Google, there was kind of more questions than answers. We're still there, we're still positive on it. With Meta, I actually felt better about the business overall, in part because the DAUs continue to crank up. It just blows me away. One in four people globally visit a meta property daily and they're going to build some of these interactive um, or more engaging more entertainment ai type of applications so that gets me excited uh, and i just think i don't use these products but i think from a perspective of continuing to drive engagement i think they're they, they're going to uh they really have something here before we go on to our final topic i did want to ask on the reality labs piece so they're going to be spending about $15 billion a year. Apple spends about $30 billion in total on R&D. And from my perspective, it makes sense for them to be investing this. I believe in the metaverse. I believe in spatial computing. Call it what you want. But they got to dial that back. And what's your take on that? They have already to some degree, right? I mean, from last year. Um, it does feel no, it's accelerating, though. The like amount a lot. that they're spending is accelerating. It does still feel like a lot. I think that they're still of Zuckerberg's mindset. There's there's a big bet for them to make there. You know, I think it's not just about glasses. It's about building worlds. It's about building the metaverse concept that, that sort of has faded away. They renamed the company, remember, a year and a half ago, two years ago now. Um, and so I think they still see a really big opportunity there to be a platform provider, hardware and software, and really digital services, a world. Um, I'm not saying that I think they should spend 15 billion a year, but they need to What's, invest what aggressively was the number there if, if you they were, want to bring it to reality. If if you're Zuckerberg and you want a seat at the table of what this next thing is, whether it's spatial computing or the metaverse, they're doing 15 billion is what they're expected to spend on Reality Labs. What what do you think is the right number? My number is five. I think I think they should be spending five billion a year on this. It's probably more than five, you know, somewhere between five and 15 is probably fair, though. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. again, it's if you think that it is the next computing platform, you could actually make an argument that there's no number. More. There's no amount right. that you you shouldn't. That's fair. And by the way, I am on that. I'm on that that uh, that. Well, then your number should be higher than five. <laughs> my, right. probably my number should be higher than yeah. five. You're right. I'm 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 beating them up for it, but I'm also the big bull at deep water when it comes to spatial computing and uh, the metaverse. So, uh, good point, uh, touche. And that's going to get us to our last topic here, which is just related to uh, some of the automotive companies. GM reported this week. And there's been more talk about just automotive more broadly. I would say slowing some of their ambitions in EV and specifically GM is uh, talking about uh, slowing the rollout of their Orion light truck factory that was supposed to be up and running kind of early 24. It's going to be late 25. They also have uh, these issues with crews, not just from a regulatory piece, but they're losing a lot of money with crews and kind of trying to get that moving forward. Uh, GM and Honda this week announced that they're, I think, pausing an initiative for electrification. I still couldn't name one electric Honda car. And uh, I think uh, there's the question about also like the current demand around EVs. And I wanna just not uh, address that. If, if, if you're okay with that, just don't talk about the current demand environment and more just talk about the trajectory here. And I would love your take. I know we're, we've been on slightly different pages on this the conversation about what's the right pace to be investing in EVs. My view is let's just these these car companies need to be all in on this because if you're not all in, you're basically eventually going to fall behind because eventually you got to make that transition. And you've had a more nuanced view and I'd be curious how that has as you've kind of thought about the news this week, how that uh kind of lines up with the views that you have about uh the pace that traditional auto should pursue EV. Well, I think you have to include the demand environment in that calculus because that's what they're doing i think that in large part a lot of this is them reacting to some of the real demand challenges that they're seeing i think the average ev right now costs ten thousand dollars more at msrp than the average uh, gas car so there's a big difference you're paying a premium for evs right now if that's the way you want to go um, mm -hmm. and i think that one of the comments if you read kind of what gm said 
they talked about uh, retiming, I believe was the word that they used in terms of some of their CapEx spend around EVs. They're not giving up, but I think they're saying, hey, maybe we don't see a path to doing as much volume as we thought here immediately. And we do have to think about our budget. We still do have a very large ICE based business and we have to retime that. So me, as I, I always like to brand myself as the rational optimist, I think EVs are the future, to be clear. I think it's going to take longer than EV bulls think it will take for EVs to overtake the market. And I think that that's kind of what you're seeing the traditional automakers react to. If, if uh, we're, we're both on the same page that EVs are the inevitable endpoint, whether it's 200 years from now or 10 years from now, whatever that point is. And I've been too optimistic in terms of how fast this is going to roll out. So I need to adjust my, my, my timelines. My question is, if uh, are we kind of is this like uh, what was outer wall? What was that red box? Like y you have to eventually make that shift. And are they are they doing it just by kind of like you think about the Honda piece kind of pulling back, or what's going on with Cruz, or the delay of the the factory by a year and a half? Are you ultimately just still keeping alive a manufacturing process that you're not going to need in the future, and Eventually, you got to bite the bullet and, and move off. So why not move faster? Your your point is, well, the demand environment's not that great right yeah, now. The market's They're, not ready for it. Just go a little bit slower, and you can kind of milk your your the the gas cow, the internal combustion engine cow, and then until you really need to start to feed this other thing. Yeah, and I think it's the wrong perspective to think it's only about what the OEMs are doing. It's also about what the market wants. I mean, we referenced this survey, the Yahoo survey uh, that came out a couple of weeks ago with Ipsos. More than half of Americans said they don't expect their next car to be an EV. I mean, there's still a lot of demand for gas cars. Still, as, as much but, as we but, all but, think but that then, gas cars are terrible, I'm that. You, have but, to, you have to pay attention to the market and what the market's asking for. And so I do I think that that should factor into the calculus and how aggressively they make these moves more than half doesn't want an ev but half is open to it and nine percent of them buy evs every year like you can view that data just as easily positive for evs as negative you could but i think that if those half some of them are going to decide they don't want an evs some will decide that they do right. and i think that the market is sort of meeting them where they're at right like i don't think there's a lot of people out there who say man i couldn't get my hands on the ev i wanted that's, that's not a mm -hmm. problem right now I do want to read a, the quote from the CEO of GM from their call uh, regarding demand. He said, I want to emphasize that our EV momentum uh, is building. Slowing EV demand growth is something that everyone's been talking about. We've seen it in the competitor earnings profiles. But I want to be clear, we're not seeing it in our portfolio right now, admittedly off of lower volumes. I wonder, is this whole slowdown in EVs really just about Tesla slowing down? It could be. It could partially be that. And again, it's, I think, like retail and the internet. I always like to use that as one of the analogies for how do markets kind of evolve over time. The internet took forever to get to 5% market share of commerce and 10%. And now we're over 20% and it's been 25 years. I don't necessarily yeah, think that EVs time. are going to go that slowly. But remember, we're talking about something where people are comfortable with gas vehicles. They understand gas vehicles. Some people actually want gas vehicles. And so to think that we're going to have like this inflection where all of a sudden it's just everybody's on v EVs, I just don't think that's realistic. Yeah, I do I don't think either. it's the future, but it, it's just going to take a really yeah. long time. My point is that I don't know when the inflection is. But if you're a traditional automaker, you better start moving there faster than I think my view is they just got to get moving there faster. And your take, it sounds like, is they're eventually going to get there, but keep keep the profit kind of thing going. Be sensitive to the overall market. Yeah, like Tesla's going to win. I've never said Tesla's not going to win. I've, I've had other debates about Tesla, but Tesla has already won the EV game. I think the auto OEMs know that. It doesn't mean they can't play. Walmart is still a relevant player in e-commerce. So is Target. And so I think you have to think about the world in that context, right? Yeah, there's other Tesla's room. Amazon. They're going to win this battle. They're going to be the biggest yeah. player. I think that's a fact. Uh, it's hard to see that changing. Mm -hmm. But I think it's still up for grabs. Who's going to be Walmart? Who's going to be Target? Who's going to be some of these other retailers yeah. 
that are big and relevant and still have other businesses actually aside from the new big thing. And I got a belief that there's going to be some big autos that are going to be the next Nokia. So uh, funny, this one's going to, the gift that keeps giving because we're a long way away from getting clarity about what the slope of that adoption curve is. And uh, speaking of slopes and adoption and uh, trying to angle towards something, I just blew right through our 15. This might be Deep Tech 320 today. Either way, a lot of fun. And on behalf of Doug, Gene, bye for now.